on this episode of In the Fight. Marines battle insurgents during Operation Hellman Viper. We take a look at the rise of green on blue attacks. Advances in new technology are helping train sailors in a more realistic setting. Doctors study service members to learn more about traumatic brain injuries. And service members find assistance in transitioning to the civilian workforce. scout snipers gathered intelligence recently during Operation Hellman Viper. This information was then handed over to another Marine team in order to give them the upper hand in disrupting the enemy. Marine Corporal Ed Gallo takes us to the front lines and files this report. Right. Right. This is Scout Sniper Platoon, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, Regimental Combat Team 6, finished the combat operation in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, August 28th. They were tasked with providing overwatch security as other Marines from Alpha Company disrupted a village of enemy insurgents. Yeah, we were running uh, disruption operations up north of uh, Azan, which we did not op previously. And let's just go up there and basically disrupt the enemy forces, use it to kind of uh, disrupt their supply lines and figure out what they're trying to do, increase our security bubble. The Marines with Scout Sniper Platoon spent most of the two-day, three-night operation on a rooftop keeping a watchful eye over the village. Um, as a Scout Sniper Team Leader, basically I take my team out and we pro provide surveillance to the battlefield for intelligence gathering purposes, uh, try and locate where the fire is coming from, and report everything up to the uh, CP. Throughout their time on the rooftop, the snipers would sometimes take accurate small arms fire and indirect fire. As the day progressed, we started taking some pretty accurate small arms fire, a little bit of machine gun fire, some IDF. From there, we were just attempted to locate the enemy and reduce the targets. As the enemy fire crept closer to their positions, the Marines patiently waited until they had positive identity on where their attacker was. Uh, had all my guys up there. We're just on observation. Did our best to locate it. And when we did, called it up to the CP, let them know what was going on, where it's coming from, and then waited for clearance to fire. With the scout snipers' vigilant eyes watching over them, the Marines of Alpha Company were able to successfully complete their operation and provide better security in the area. Corporal Ed Gallo, Aga Ahmad, Afghanistan. It's been a repeated phrase in the news lately, green on blue attacks. These attacks on coalition forces by Afghan security are steadily on the rise, and NATO Channel correspondent Jake Tupman talked with a NATO deputy commander to find out what steps are being taken to end this inside threat. It's a great day at Camp Shurabak in Helmand province, and 1,400 new recruits have graduated into the Afghan National Army. But it's not been the graduations grabbing the headlines recently. It's been the rise in so-called green on blue attacks where a coalition soldier's been killed by a member of the Afghan security forces or someone posing as a member. Uh, where there's an insurgency, there is going to be an attempt to infiltrate. Um, and you can't stop it. But what you can try to do is neutralize it. And we're trying to find the best ways to not overcome just the, 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 the attacks that are occurring, but I think more importantly, those conditions that allow that type of an insider threat to flourish. So far this year, there have been 31 incidents of insider attacks, leaving 39 dead. That's more than any previous year. With both Afghan and ISAF soldiers targeted in the attacks, ISAF is keen to point out that this is a shared problem, and that they are working closely with Afghan officers to try and prevent such incidents. But there's other issues that right now we're still trying to define. What are some of the external factors uh, that are involved that would force an individual to pick up his arms and attack those uh, that were previously 
his friends. The poverty, the illiteracy, uh, the unemployment rates, the child mortality, all of those conditions that would lead people to be susceptible to that type of influence. The many reasons for insider attacks has led the recruitment and vetting process to come under scrutiny, something ISAF say they are working on with the Afghans. But while ISAF acknowledge these attacks have tragic consequences, they also say that with almost half a million ISAF and Afghan troops in the country and interaction between the two encouraged, these incidents are not endemic and will not derail the efforts of the coalition forces to develop their Afghan partners. When I see the Afghans graduate, it's a measure of success. But you know, the true, the true test is our ability to retain them, to develop them as they move forward. I think the, the one area that uh, we sometimes overlook is the pride that Afghanistan takes now in those graduates. You see now the tribal elders making personal recommendations on which young men in their tribes are now eligible or should be considered to be soldiers. So you are seeing a rejuvenation, a revitalization of the profession of arms here in Afghanistan, and we can't underestimate that. This is Jake Tutman reporting from Helmand for the NATO Channel. Training exercises are a key factor in building military capabilities, whether it's national or international. Gail McCabe reports from the Republic of Botswana, site of Exercise Southern Accord 12, where the strongest lessons to be learned were grounded in the experience. Open fire! From a soldier's perspective, being part of a live fire event is training payoff. You really don't always get the opportunity to come out, shoot live rounds, mine with other countries. Like, it's an experience. For Specialist Mark Carpenter and more than 1,200 other military personnel, the experience is Exercise Southern Accord, a bilateral training exercise with Botswana Defense Forces, the BDF. The live fire is the culminating event of three weeks dedicated to strengthening military capabilities. It's more than promoting peace and stability and, and security. It's, uh, it's a sharing of respect among two militaries. Botswana is known as a stable and economically developing nation in the southern reaches of Africa. Its military, the BDF, is highly regarded as a proud and professional force. Captain Kubanji says what Southern Accord offers is the chance to learn something new. Come together in an exercise like this, it's time to compare how uh, each army does doing their business. The comparisons range from peacekeeping operations to the use of non-lethal force, engineering, humanitarian assistance, and a wide range of tactical skills. U.S. forces deployed from 16 states and across multiple time zones to be here, making Southern Accord 12 the most comprehensive training event to be held between the two nations. This has been not only a, a great training opportunity for us in the Botswanans, but also this is very unique, and the experiences we learned here will help us in the future. A future that soldiers like Carpenter feel they are shaping now. I mean, the more friendlies we have, the more teams that we have when international crises happen. Sponsored by U.S. Africa Command, executed by U.S. Army Africa, and hosted by Botswana, Southern Accord is a valuable guide for more training events in Southern Africa, a potential template shaped with experience. Gil McKay, Botswana. Hi, I'm Master Sergeant Francine Wilson, stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. I'd like to send a shout out to my husband, OSC Select Ethan Wilson, stationed at Mizran 9 in Whidbey Island, Washington. I'm Lieutenant Brett Knudsen, proud member of Joint Task Force Empire. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my respect and appreciation for all first responders, to include FDNY, NYPD, and take this opportunity to tell my wife, Nicole, and my kids, Nicholas and Emily, I love them, miss you guys, I'll be home soon. Hello, I'm Sergeant Robert White from Centerville, Tennessee, serving in Camp Casey, Korea with Alpha Company, 70th BSP, 210th Fire Brigade. I'd like to say hello to my wife, Anna Marie White, currently in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Take care and hope to see you soon. Love you. Coming up, we see some new technology that is helping train sailors. 
and doctors study service members to learn more about traumatic brain injuries. Check out DividsHub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. What are the two official languages of Afghanistan? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divots, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. The environment is my passion. Every day, I live for the outdoors and all of its challenges. That's why I enlisted in the Coast Guard. Now, I serve to protect the environment and defend my country. It's like I was born for this. Were you born ready for a greater challenge? Find out at GoCoastGuard.com. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend, to my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan, to my family out in Tucson, Arizona, to my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa, to everybody in Texas, in York, Pennsylvania, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, Harrisonburg, Virginia, Orlando, Florida, Oceanside, California, and Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys, I miss you, and I hope I'll see you soon. What are the two official languages of Afghanistan? The answer is A and B, Dari and Pashto. Aircraft rescue and firefighting Marines aboard Marine Corps Air Station Miramar work and train to ensure disaster is always avoided on the flight line. Marine Lance Corporal John Tucker brings us this story. Marines on the battlefield rely on each other to survive. And on the flight line, it's no different. That's why the aircraft rescue and firefighters aboard Marine Corps Air Station in Miramar have a strong bond. They count on each other every time they move closer to flame and smoke. You know, it's a really tight friendship. And we're, we're here more than we are with our family, so it is like an actual other another family. You know, I know they say, you know, brothers in arms, but I mean, it, it really has an impact here because we're all we have, you know. Aircraft rescue Marines often work 24-hour shifts, helping to prevent disaster on the flight line with a somber but motivational thought. The hardest part of having a job here at Crash Crew is knowing full well that it's one of your friends or somebody that you're actually pulling out of that aircraft, saving, or not saving, but having to pick up the remains. Miramar's aircraft rescue and firefighters train daily to ensure that all Marines' lives on the flight line are in good hands. From Miramar, California, I'm Lance Corporal John Tucker. Advances in technology have made virtual reality so realistic that the Navy has adopted these simulations in training its sailors. Petty Officer Second Class Blake Midnight shows us some of this technology in his report. Train today to be prepared for tomorrow. This is a constant in every United States Navy sailor's life, both onshore and at sea. As advancements in technology improve, so does the training for these sailors. The U.S. Fifth Fleet has been using this evolution to its advantage, putting members of embarked security teams through high-tech simulators to better prepare them to make the critical judgment calls when protecting our high-value naval assets. Before any of those sailors go out on mission, my training team here has to sign off that they are ready to go. The training team made up of experienced individuals who've done the mission before, know what they're doing, and can say, yes, this sailor is ready, understands the rules, and, willing, and is willing to engage them, and understands how to engage them in a thoughtful way. So Warning Shots Us, they're the last piece of our run-up to having to use deadly fire, which, of course, is the last resort. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, the Navy has very specific guidelines on how to conduct warning shots, and we train our folks to those. And so what the sailor, we teach the sailors to do is to aim at the vessel to begin with, 
but then to offset either in front or even in some cases behind, depending on the developing situation, the vessel that's approaching. Not only do they move in front of or behind that offset, but they also depress the barrel of the weapon. We also have them look at the fields of fire beyond the individual vessel they're dealing with, and so they will not fire even a warning shot if there's not a clear field of fire behind them. From Naval Support Activity Bahrain, I'm Petty Officer Blake Midnight. Magnetic resonance imaging machines allow medical staff to get a better look at tissue in the human body, including the brain. Navy Petty Officer Peggy Trujillo tells us how the MRI trailer in Kandahar, Afghanistan is helping doctors conduct a study that will explain more about traumatic brain injury. Service members in Afghanistan who encounter explosive devices can suffer from unseen wounds such as traumatic brain injury. Medical staff at the Warrior Recovery Center at Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan are using a high-tech magnetic resonance imaging device to conduct a study on how the blasts are affecting soldiers. We re the reason we're doing the study is because we really do not understand how all these blast injuries are affecting our service members. And right now in theater, we have this new amazing um, MRI system, um, the D uh, diffusion sensor imaging, which looks, um, which the images are very, very clear and precise. The Warrior Recovery Center screens their patients to determine if they can be part of the study. But all patients with TBI symptoms receive therapeutic treatment to get them ready to return to the field. It may be something where I bring out my weapon and have them disassemble and assemble it for time using that sequencing, timing, processing speed, long-term memory for most of them because they have the exact same weapon. Or it can be a board game um, where you still have to have some kind of planning, sequencing, able to follow directions, remember the directions. It could be something as simple as me throwing ping pong balls at them to work the reaction time. The doctors and staff can see the difference physically between when a patient comes in and when they leave. And it's funny because when they come in, you know, it's like they're, you know, they're here and by the time they leave, they're just back to their old self again. It's just, it's just amazing. It's just an amazing group of uh, people to work with. The MRI study includes first-time TBI patients, those who have faced multiple blasts, and a control group who has seen no exposure to explosions. Petty Officer Peggy Trujillo, Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan. When disaster strikes, the capability of helping those in need of medical attention is critical to the military's commitment in assisting its allies throughout the world. Army Staff Sergeant Robert Hamm takes us to Japan to show us how soldiers accomplish this mission. Soldiers from the 325th Combat Support Hospital out of Independence, Missouri, participate in U.S. Army Pacific Medical Exercise 2012 at the Sagami General Depot, Japan. Medics 12 was led and coordinated by the 18th Medical Command, the U.S. Army's lead medical command in the Pacific. The soldiers built the combat support hospital for the first time in the region since 2000. Lieutenant General Francis J. Wierzynski, the U.S. Army Pacific Commander, visited the cache site and met with soldiers. We have such a capability here with these cache hospitals, and we have incredibly trained personnel. We have the best equipment in the world, and we can pull this stuff out anywhere for any mission at any time. And if you walk through this cash hospital, you can see that it has the capabilities of doing things no matter what happens, disaster man-made or natural. The U.S. soldiers shared medical techniques while working closely with their Japanese counterparts. And we're both given the opportunity to teach one another things. It's not a matter of teaching them something new. It's just a matter of showing them that we do things a certain way and they do things a certain way and both of them work and um, we've just learned a various amount of skills from each other. Reporting from Sagamihara, Japan, I'm Staff Sergeant Robert Hamm. Hi, I'm Sergeant Karapin with 1186 MP Company in Kabul, Afghanistan at Camp Phoenix. Just doing a shout out to my wife, my kids. I love you all. Miss you. Be home soon. Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant Bernard Fordham. I'd like to give a shout out to my mom, dad, in Columbia, South Carolina. All my friends and family from the Joint Task Force Empire, 411th Engineer Brigade. Hi, my name is Sergeant First Class Kirk. I'm from Amateur Troop 191 Cap here in Afghanistan. I want to say I love you to my wife and kids in Schweinfurt, Germany, and I want to give a special happy birthday to my daughter, Kaylee. My name is Sergeant Latoya Rivas from 203rd BSB, and I'd like to send a message to my babies, Jacia, Trey Kira, Kalea, Quintrell, and Tanil. Mommy loves you, and I'll be home soon. Behave. 
Coming up, service members find assistance in transitioning to the civilian workforce. And we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. When was the last time the U.S. Congress formally declared war? The answer when we return. Training is about more than muscle. It's about inner strength. So I push myself. That's why I serve in the United States Coast Guard. I train with the best, a team that shares my drive and commitment. We collect intelligence, guard our shores against drug smugglers, and keep our waterways safe because our nation expects more. If you expect more, maybe you were born ready. Find out at GoCoastGuard.com. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. When was the last time the U.S. Congress formally declared war? The answer is B, World War II. Being physically fit is one of the most important requirements for any service member in the United States military. In Kandahar, servicemen and women are pushing themselves and each other in a powerlifting meet. Airman Jimmy Moreland brings us this story. In a hot, muggy hangar on Kandahar Airfield, this group of soldiers is doing more than their typical physical training session. Today, they're competing in a powerlifting meet. Men and women strive to record the heaviest one-lift totals in squat, bench press, and deadlift. My bad buddy talked me into joining, and it's all about seeing how far you can push yourself, your body, physically, mentally, with as many weights as you can. This isn't something a person can just walk into. It takes months, even years, to perfect the technique needed to safely lift. When competition day arrives, it's just as much a mental exercise as a physical one. You really don't know how great you're gonna do until you're actually doing it, because you get that adrenaline rush, your battle buddies out there in the audience, and everyone's cheering for you to lift as much as you can. <laughs> Even the people you're competing against, everyone just wants you to do as best as you can. For some soldiers, lifting is a productive way to spend off time on deployment. Instead of laying in a room watching TV or playing Xbox, we were going to the gym for two hours a day six days a week. For these competitors, the benefits of lifting can be seen outside the gym as well. I went from uh, 220 pounds when I got here in January down to 188, 185. And the only thing I've been doing is lifting weights. I think all of it translates because you push yourself here in the weights, then you can push yourself when you're actually doing PT, you can push yourself when you're actually doing your PT test, or even in your job or anything else that you're doing. These soldiers can take with them the skills and lessons learned in this gym, whether they came away from this event with a medal or not. Airman Jimmy Moreland, Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan. When a service member finishes his or her service in the military, how does that person transition into the civilian workforce? Army Sergeant Ashley Ferguson answers this question in her story. Leaving the service can be a difficult change for some service members, so the Warrior Transition Battalion partners with Higher America's Heroes to help ease the transition from the military to the civilian world. Higher America's Heroes is a nonprofit corporation connecting America's major companies with service members and their families. Our mission is to heal our soldiers as well as to transition our soldiers, whether it be transitioning them out into the civilian sector uh, or back uh, into uh, the military sector. 
but inevitably, everybody's going to leave the service uh, at one point in time. Hire America's Heroes sets up stations to offer service members an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with possible employers from public companies as well as government agencies. Soldiers also sat down with trained professionals in job readiness to perfect their resume. Having a good resume plays a key role in the employment process. I'm going to take advantage of everything I do have, and uh, even talking to other people that had nothing to do with law enforcement, they still gave me a lot of uh, very good, sound advice on looking for jobs and how to apply strategies to go about applying for jobs. So I'm very glad I came, and um, this is just the second step. And there's many more to be taken, and I'll be taking them. Prince not only walked away with a few job offers, he also left with an opportunity to expand his job search and perfect his craft. For the Field Report, I'm Army Sergeant Ashlyn Ferguson. Divids is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, Divids gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at DividsHub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at DividsHub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divis has to offer. As we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight.